Hey there Spartans, welcome back for Tank Ponds! But in all seriousness, one of the main subjects in this week's cannon fodder are indeed tanks, as if that wasn't painfully obvious. So thanks for joining me and let's get to it. We start out with an Oni variant of the new Scorpion, but we also get some interesting details on the new tanks in general. This is the MA-20 Scorpion, an upgrade that has half the mass with the same firepower and armor protection as the classic M-808. Funny enough, the classic Scorpion actually received its fair flack over the years for the huge profile and the elevated turret, both of which make it an easy target compared to modern tanks. It seems 343 has taken some of that criticism to heart. Anyway, this Oni variant specifically is outfitted with experimental ammunition, taking advantage of the latest energetic propellants and features heavier armor than the standard M820. Next up we have the new Mongoose, the M290 ATV, nicknamed the Mother Goose by infantrymen and women. The variant we're seeing, one I have at least on one occasion referred to as an industrial Mongoose, is a heavily armored variant from Liang Dortmund. Liang Dortmund is a new company, so there's not much else to talk about there. After that we have the returning Gun Goose from Halo 2 Anniversary. This variant, however, is outfitted with grenade launchers rather than the light machine guns we saw in H2A. Next up we have the new Urban Rocket Hog, which, along with having a new paint job, features upgraded armor and a noted improvised rocket turret. Next is the Oni Gauss Hog. Like the Oni tank, the Gauss Hog is heavily armored. Interestingly, the ammunition produces a lingering area of effect damage upon impact through means currently unknown. Except to Oni, of course. Finally, we have a new variant of the T-54 Banshee known as the Banshee Ultra. This variant is outfitted with heavy armor and upgraded armament, and only entrusted to skilled Sunheili pilots. God, I cannot wait to read some of the deeper lore on these and all the other vehicles in Halo 5. There's so much to take in. But with all that, we move on to what I'm sure you've all been waiting for, a breakdown of the recent trailer for Halo The Fall of Reach animated series. There's a lot to discuss, so let's do it. We open with the Chief on a planet that looks very recently glassed. It looks to be the same one we saw in this piece of concept art, which I originally theorized to be Reach. It would be appropriate for John to recall his past while visiting the glassed Reach. Moving forward, we have the familiar scene of Halsey and Keys as they approach Eridanus II before skipping forward to Halsey telling the Spartan candidates about the reason for their abduction. Now, let's get this out of the way. This series is going to take quite a few liberties as we'll see going forward. In the novel, when the Spartan candidates were first addressed, each one was accompanied by a trainer to keep them in order. Of course, what we're seeing could also be later in the story, after the kids have had some time to get acclimated to their new lives. Now, interestingly, during the course of the scene, Halsey refers to the program as Orion 2, despite canonically having decided on Spartan four years earlier. I can't imagine why 343 would do this, considering the numerous steps they take to avoid confusing fans. While longtime fans are more than familiar with the Orion program, bringing it up here just seems unnecessary at best. Moving forward, we get some scenes of the Spartans doing some training inside, followed by one of the more famous training scenes when the Spartans are basically abandoned in the wilderness. They were given map fragments that lead to an extraction zone, but they had to figure this all out on their own. During this, we also get our first look at Mendez, and I gotta say, he looks a lot younger than I would have ever imagined. Still, I love the look. We then jump forward to scenes with the Spartans being augmented, and boy is it brutal. Good to see that 343 won't be shying away from the horrors these kids endured. I'm also hoping we might get acknowledgement of Halsey putting the washouts in cryo, hoping that they might one day be resuscitated, as mentioned in her journal. After that, we skip to first contact with the Covenant, and it looks like 343 are going to do it some real justice. Interestingly though, the Navy officer here, and another in a later scene, both have post-war service uniforms, rather than the established wartime uniform we saw both in Halo 2 and in Halo 3. Moving on, we get to see the Spartan 2s receiving their Mjolnir armor for the first time. Now in this panning shot, we see Kelly, who looks like she was modeled after the actress from Forward Unto Dawn, followed by the massive Sam 034, then Fred 104, and finally John himself. And interestingly, this is the oldest version of John we've seen without a helmet on. Also of interest are the undersuits, which are in the style we saw in Halo 4. This is one retcon I personally don't have an issue with, as I'm actually a fan of that undersuit design. Even better though is the fact that the Mjolnir Mark IV armor that the Spartans are given is almost a carbon copy of the Halo Wars Mark IV. Fucking finally! The only real major change, though there are some other minor ones, is the addition of jetpacks on the back. Now in the grand scheme, this is a small thing, one I can certainly live with. At least it's not the fucking armor from the package like we saw in Forward Unto Dawn. Seriously, what the hell? And honestly, we don't know yet if 343 is going to imply these are built onto the armor or additional components that can be added. We'll see. Now, I have to address one thing that fans have been particularly rabid over. 
Sam's helmet. Yes, it shares a similar appearance with CQB, and yes, the CQB variant canonically wasn't released until 2548. This is an early developmental permutation as described by Grimm. It's not CQB, just an early helmet design that was likely appropriated when the CQB variant was actually being developed. Honestly, this is small beans compared to some of the other things in this trailer, such as Sam having a BR-85 at a time when the BR-55 was still a prototype. Now granted, this could easily be another early prototype. If we know anything about technology, we know it can be in prototype stages for years. Still, I would have rather seen a BR-55, or perhaps an AR. Anyway, as the trailer moves on, we see some things that are much harder to explain away. Post-war armor variants. First, we see the boot of a post-war Songheili Ranger, then an Ebiation Jackal, and, most egregious of all, a grunt with a post-war combat harness. Now, I can forgive the Ebiation Jackal. Other canon material has shown that this subspecies did serve during the Covenant War. I can even forgive the post-war Ranger armor. Jules Covenant has been shown to use older technologies, such as the outdated Phantoms and Beam Rifles, and a popular theory back in the day is that some of the armor variants seen in Jules Covenant were old variants. It certainly worked well with Cortana's comment about them not being outfitted like standard military. However, I cannot forgive this goddamn grunt. I don't care about the phenotype, it's the goddamn nose tube, which has specifically been stated to be an upgrade made sometime following the end of the Covenant War. Much as I appreciate other efforts to stay true to established canon, shit like this pisses me off. As I've said before, I find it insulting that someone at 343 or Microsoft thinks fans are too stupid to recognize simple things like armor and phenotypic variation. I mean, look at the monumentous effort in Halo 2 Anniversary to stay true to classic designs. Where is that now? <sighs> anyway, we get some more action scenes set during the Battle of Kai Seti 4, during which we see Kelly using the Halo 4-5 M45D shotgun. Now I know some other fans were pissed at this too, but keep in mind that the shotgun we use in CEA is the M45E. After that, the trailer ends with Halsey putting on John's helmet, which, if we look closely, is actually a mix of the classic Halo Wars Mark IV and the Chiefs Mark VI Gen 2 helmet from Halo 4-5. And that's it for the trailer. I'm still very much on the shelf with this series, but I have to say, Sequence has outdone themselves with the animation. If nothing else, it looks spectacular. And with that, we bring to a close another Cannon Fodder article and move on to the new universe entries. This week we have Senior Chief Petty Officer Franklin Mendez, former UNSC Colonel Robert Watts, and Spartan Samuel 034. Starting out with Mendez, we actually get quite a bit of info. It's funny looking back how much fans love this guy and yet how little we actually knew about him. Franklin Mendez was born on March 21st, 2492 on, interestingly, Sigma Octanus IV. Now, sadly, with the revelation of his birthday, we can now say for certain that Mendez was not a member of the original Orion program, a longtime theory among fans. The program's augmentation phase ended in 2496, when Mendez would have been four. The young Mendez enlisted with the UNSC at 16 with parental consent. In 2514, he was transferred to Navy Special Weapons and soon after caught the eyes of Oni. And then, as we know, he would go on to train both the Spartan Twos and later the Spartan Threes. In October of 2552, Mendez was present on Onyx when the planet came under attack from Forerunner Sentinels and later, Sangheili forces. He would also find himself trapped in the Onyx Shield world along with Dr. Halsey, Blue Team, and a number of Spartan Threes from Gamma Company. Check my history of Blue Team if you want more details on that. After being rescued, he was present at the memorial service at Voy in March of 2553 and retired not long after, due in part to his feelings about having trained child soldiers. Next up is Colonel Robert Watts. Born on August 16th, 2455, Watts was once a loyal member of the UNSC Marine Corps and a heavily decorated soldier. However, years of encounters with independent movements in the outer colonies changed his views, and in 2480, Watts defected. Leading a fairly well-armed insurrectionist cell, Watts was able to take control of Eridanus II by 2495, but was effectively kicked off the planet years later as a result of counterinsurgency operations. In that time, other insurrectionist cells had been hit, leading to many splintering off after their leadership was killed or captured. Watts would eventually realign these splinter groups into what the UNSC called the United Rebel Front, a title insurrectionists came to hold as a badge of honor. Interestingly, the term United Rebel Front has a bit of a storied history with the franchise, at first a general term for various insurrectionist movements, Halopedia misinterpreted the phrase as a proper title. When compiling the Halo Encyclopedia, those behind the project frequently referenced Halopedia and took the page to mean that there was an actual group known as the United Rebel Front. The misunderstanding made its way into final print and has since been adapted into canon. Anyway, sometime before 2525, Watts and his cell had been forced to retreat to an asteroid base known as Eridanus Secundus. 
In September of 2525, the newly minted Spartan II's completed their first mission when they successfully infiltrated the base and kidnapped Watts. Finally, we have Sam 034. Born on July 10th, 2511 on Harvest, Sam was the biggest and strongest of the Spartan II's, standing around 7 foot 6 without his armor, and one of the original members of Blue Team. During their first engagement against the Covenant, Blue Team boarded an enemy vessel to blow it up. Sam's vacuum suit was punctured, so he elected to remain behind. He was the first Spartan to die in battle. And that brings this week to a close. A lot of good, some not so good, but the article itself was top notch as always. Thank you all for joining me, and until next time, keep shining bright. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up, subscribing, and sharing it around. You are the reason I get to keep doing this, so thank you, profusely thank you. If you want to dive deeper into Halo's lore, head over to the Halo Archive. It's a lore-based community that welcomes everyone from experts to rookies. No matter what your working knowledge, you'll be sure to find a friend and a good time.